Okay, apologies to those online. I'm told we didn't have any sound on the live stream. My name is Sean. Welcome to a very special Lunch with Books. Uh, I mentioned just quickly that on Tuesday, Eli Lambie will be here at noon, and on the following week, Jeff Forley, the Wheeling Poetry Series. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a special program. Uh, we're calling it Crossing the River for Freedom, Slavery, and the Underground Railroad. It is the launch of Wheeling, the city of Wheeling's Juneteenth celebration. And Christina Essel is here. Uh, she is a public historian and director of the curator, sorry, director and curator of the Underground Railroad Museum in Flushing, Ohio. If you haven't visited, you should. Uh, she earned her master's degree in public history, museum studies from Southern New Hampshire University and her bachelor's degree in history at Ohio University. She also serves as education chairwoman for the Belmont County NAACP and president of the History Detectives of Belmont County. Uh, the Juneteenth, she'll tell you more about it, continues tomorrow and Sunday as well. Here is Christina Esley. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not used to microphones being in my face, so. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for having me today. Um, as uh, Sean had said, this is sort of a launch program to our three-day uh, program for Juneteenth. Um, we're very excited. Um, the Underground Railroad Museum is um, collaborating with Wheeling this year, and we're super excited about it. We have a lot um, coming up this week, this weekend. Um, I placed programs at everyone's table, so please feel free to take that home with you and take a look at it. Um, so this is day one. <laughs> Tomorrow at five o'clock at the YWCA, we will be having Rory Rennick, um, who is a reenactor. He will be acting out the Henry Box Brown story. Um, at 6.30, we will have an authentic African drum and dance group from Columbus. Um, and then Sunday, we will have a memorial service at Market Plaza all at five and then followed by um, a band, some food trucks. Um, it's gonna be a wonderful time, so I hope you guys can join us. Um, so this project um, was the research based on the Underground Railroad in Belmont County um, to fulfill my uh, thesis for my master's program. And I decided to turn it into a PowerPoint presentation and share it with everybody. Um, so this is called Project UGRR Belmont County. Um, so when we uh, look at the Underground Railroad of Belmont County, it's important to note slavery here in West Virginia, um, especially Wheeling, where the slave auction block was located. Um, a lot of people don't realize that slavery was just across the river. Um, so slaves were brought to Market Plaza for the auction block. Um, they were kept in the jailhouse overnight and then sold at auction. Um, so with all of this going on, we had um, a lot of people witness slavery for the first time here in Wheeling. Um, and we'll talk about Benjamin Lundy, who started the first um, anti-slavery society in Belmont County. Um, but also during their, the river, the Ohio River would actually freeze over in the wintertime and dry up in the summertime. And there were places that you could literally walk across the river. Um, so, so Quakerism in Belmont County was huge. Um, the Quakers originated in Virginia and they split over the issue of slavery. So the pro-slavery Quakers remained in Virginia and the anti-slavery Quakers moved to Belmont County. The first meeting house was established in um, outside Colerain. It was the Concord Hicksite Meeting House. Um, in 1802, and there, um, the Quakers strongly believed against slavery. They encouraged their um, 
their congregation to assist runaway slaves, to help in any way that, that you can, um, feed them, clothe them, educate them, um, and also not only um, the, the enslaved, but also Native Americans. Um, so they started schools for um, black children and Native American children. Um, so they were, they did a lot for um, the minorities in the area. So just across the river, um, Martinsville, which is now Martins Ferry, it was considered the first stop. Um, there, uh, here we have the Jacob Van Pelt House, which is still standing today. A lot of these um, stops of the Underground Railroad are not standing, um, but this one luckily is, and it's in very good shape. But Jacob Van Pelt would um, take the runaway slaves in and prepare them for the next leg of the journey. During my research, um, I was able to locate and map 25 stops of the Underground Railroad in Belmont County. Um, and I only knew of two when I started. So the research is quite vast, um, which makes it a very exciting story. Um, so this was Jacob Van Pelt. And if anyone has ever read uh, Bonnie Belmont, um, which is written by Judge John Cochran. Uh, I think it was published in 1907. Um, it's a fantastic book, first-hand account of that time period. And I got a lot of information from that as well. So the Copes and Copes Mill. So Joshua Cope um, was very big um, as a conductor and Conductors did not talk about their work. Um, the Underground Railroad was very secretive. If you were caught assisting a runaway slave, you could be fined $1,000 or imprisoned for six months. Um, so they were very quiet. Um, Joshua Cope, he, he owned a flower mill. Um, and why is that important? Well, um, so, Prior to 1850, if runaway slaves made it to Ohio, they were considered free. Um, however, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was passed and it made it very difficult for the runaway slaves. Um, prior to 1850, the plantation owners and bounty hunters could not come into Ohio, um, retrieve the runaway slaves and take them back down south. That was considered kidnapping. There were anti-kidnapping laws in place. Um, so therefore, after the Fugitive Slave Act, um, they were able to come into Ohio, locate the runaway slaves and take them back down south. Um, so they were being chased after um, by bloodhounds, the plantation owners, bounty hunters. The runaway slaves had a, a bounty above their heads. There was always a reward for the return of a runaway slave. Um, so therefore, um, water was very important in cutting off the scent trail. So um, these flowering mills they would open it up for the runaway slaves and let them hide behind the water wheel so that that would cut off the scent trail and the dog, the bloodhounds would be confused. So this is very important. Um, Thomas Pointer, he owned a, he lived in a log tenement home behind um, Jacob Van Pelt's house. Um, he, but he was also, he was, he was a black gentleman. He was a leader for the Underground Railroad movement. He was a freed slave. Um, and he had himself been enslaved in Virginia. So once he was manumitted, he was working with Jacob Van Pelt. Um, but he played a crucial role um, when, when the plantation owners would show up at Jacob Van Pelt's home, the slaves would then go to um, Thomas Pointer's house. And there they would hide up in the attic, attic behind a false door, um, and they would take a wooden, uh, a wooden ladder up into the attic. And then they would, they would uh, his wife, Thomas's wife, would then take boiling water um, and clean the pegs of the ladder and then spray cayenne pepper on the pegs 
to confuse the dogs and totally deter them, and it worked. Um, but he's, he spent the re remainder of his life assisting with the Underground Railroad. Haynes Mill, um, the same scenario, um, another flowering mill um, down near Colerain, Martins Ferry area. Um, I did find a article in the, um, through the Ohio History Connection where I got a lot of my information also. Um, backing up a moment, uh, Wilbur Siebert, he was a Ohio State prof history professor in the late 1800s. Um, he was also one of the first historians to begin researching the Underground Railroad. So what he would do during the summer, he would have his children or his uh, students go when they went home during the summer, he would have them talk to individuals get, uh, getting information on the Underground Railroad. He ended up mapping and researching the entire Northwest Territory and all the trail, he mapped all the trails. So therefore, um, most of my information I got from the Ohio History Connection via the correspondence letters that were sent to Wilbur Siebert. They have digitized all of the letters that have to do with the state of Ohio. So, wonderful wealth of um, information. Joel Wood, um, his home uh, in Martins Ferry is, was located where the parking lot for the East Ohio Regional Hospital is. Um, I just met a woman two weeks ago who said that they tried to fight for that house in the, uh, uh, in the 60s and it, they failed. Um, but he was very well known. Um, he obviously Martins Ferry right across the river from Wheeling. He would take in the runaway slaves and mainly keep them in the cellar, um, feed them, clothe them, get them ready for the next leg of the journey. Um, and if he didn't have room, his neighbors across the street would take in the runaway slaves, um, the Hargrave family. So um, they worked closely together and um, luckily I was able to find a handwritten letter by Joel Wood to Wilbur Siebert about his activities with the Underground Railroad. Floral Valley, this station was located above Martins Ferry and it was owned by, it was manned by two freed slaves, uh, Richard Naylor and Samuel Cooper. Um, so therefore, these two gentlemen owned a ferry. They would ferry across the river at night, go up to the slave auction block, act intoxicated so no one would pay any attention to them, go up to the slaves and tell them where to go and who to look for and we've come to rescue you. Um, so they would ferry them back over and then point them to the direction of the next station, you know, what to look for, uh, different indicators. Um, so it's, it's a really neat story. Um, however, Samuel Cooper um, got caught and had to take the Underground Railroad himself um, up to Canada. Colerain. So Josiah Fox, um, he was born in New England, or in England, and moved to America in 1793. He was at, he was a Quaker, but he was also a naval architect. The Quakers um, did not definitely frowned upon any warlike activities, um, so he was disowned by um, the Quakers. And then, after the War of 1812, he was invited back. So um, obviously he must have done very well for himself. <laughs> um, so, but he was also a slave owner. Um, he owned a slave by the name of William Fletcher. And when he moved to Ohio, he had freed William. William came with him still and worked with him and assisted him as um, the assistant to the naval architect. So I think that's pretty interesting but he was also a conductor of the Underground Railroad, but I didn't find much information about his activity with that. But a lot of the times too, um, 
there's not a lot of documentation. Um, they didn't, you know, write down how many slaves they assisted or, you know, any specific stories until after the ending of slavery, um, when it was safe to talk about. So in Bridgeport, we had um, Alexander and Lydia Bronham. Um, I didn't find much information about their activity, but the home is still standing. It looks like it's, it's, uh, it's got about four apartments in it now. Um, but it's a neat looking house. Um, I did locate their, um, the grave site. Um, they are buried in Week Cemetery um, out in um, Martins Ferry, Colrain area, um, as well as um, another family who we will talk about here in a minute. So um, I don't know much about this family, but I do know that um, Alexander was wealthy. He left um, $1,000 to his family when he passed. Um, and we will talk about da Dangerfield Newbie here toward the end of my presentation. But I'm thinking that um, the Bronhams assisted Dangerfield Newbie in some way. So Benjamin Lundy, um, he was born in New Jersey in 1789. He moved to Wheeling as a young man to become a tanner. And while he was there, he witnessed slavery for the first time, um, a slave auction, and he absolutely despised it. Therefore, in 1815, on his 26th birthday, um, he started the, hu the uh, you may, <laughs> The Union Humane Society, um, and at first it, it started with about six members. He uh, told his neighbors to come join his society, and then six months later he had about 400 members. So um, the movement really uh, started picking up steam due to his efforts, um, which is uh, really neat. Um, but in 1822, he then moved to Mount Pleasant, which was a Quaker town, very involved with the Underground Railroad. Um, and there he started writing anti-slavery pamphlets, uh, The Genius of Universal Emancipation and The Philanthropist. Um, these are available online. They're very interesting. And um, one thing Benjamin Lundy um, was fighting for was um, relocating the slaves back to Africa, um, recolonization. Um, the, it's kind of weird to think that um, the abolitionists wanted to send the slaves back to Africa and the slaves did not want to go back to Africa. They wanted to be free in this country and they wanted the same rights as the US citizens. Um, so it did not work, and even President Lincoln alloc allocated $60,000 for the recolonization effort, um, which did not work. So, but they did, I think there was about 10 to 20,000 who were relocated to what is known today as Liberia. Um, and it's, it was kind of difficult um, for setting up a democratic society in Africa, um, but it's, it's still thriving today in Africa. So Jacob and Isaac Holloway. Um, this is an interesting story, but um, you can see there, that's the house in Flushing. It's no longer standing. Um, it was built in the early 1800s and demolished in the early 2000s. Um, so Jacob Holloway was the station master. His son Isaac was the agent. And um, Isaac would bring in the slaves at night. And there would be a ladder that went up to the attic window. So the slaves would then climb the ladder into the attic at night. You could see the tall trees on the right side of the house, I had to make sure I was looking at the same, um, but they would be totally concealed and no one would see them going up the ladder. Um, one thing, you know, I've mentioned, um, these stations were strategically placed five to 10 miles apart from each other. So pretty much every town in Beaumont County had a safe house. 
Um, they were on top of a hill where they could be seen miles around. Um, and so Isaac would then take the slaves to either Moorfield or Freeport, which is about another 10 to 15 miles from Flushing. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting, but they would be hidden in a covered wagon, either under some hay um, or, you know, whatever they could be covered with, um, bags of feed or anything, really. Um, I've, I've even heard of um, slaves being hidden in coffins, um, false bottoms of carriages. Um, people were very creative with how they transported the, the fugitive slaves. Edeline Nichols, um, he was the, the conductor in Lloydsville. Lloydsville is located um, about 15 minutes from Flushing and another 15 to St. Clairsville. Um, he was a very interesting individual, but um, he was a conductor and an abolitionist. Um, one thing to note, the difference between a conductor and an abolitionist, for those who may not know, um, a conductor um, held the stations at their home and were, was quiet about their work. An abolitionist was someone who spoke out publicly against slavery, um, you know, were trying to sway the minds of the public. Um, so this gentleman did it both, and that is very dangerous work. Um, because especially the Underground Railroad really picked up steam around the 1850s. Prior to that, um, they weren't really liked, especially the abolitionists. So Eli Nichols, he wrote, he wrote to Benjamin Lundy um, and the philanthropist and had him publish this story um, so Eli Nichols and a gentleman from Belmont that we'll talk about shortly, uh, Dr. Johnson, they decided to go to Barnesville and have an anti-slavery debate. Um, that wasn't a very good idea. So um, uh, there was the, the townspeople were not happy that they were there. Um, one gentleman ho hollered out, um, Eli or Nichols, I've got a rail ready for you. Um, another gentleman um, hollered out at, to Dr. Johnson, um, I'm going to knock your lights out. So the people weren't happy. They descended upon the both of them and they were beat pretty bad. Um, but they didn't give up. Two weeks later, they tried again. And at that point, the townspeople then decided they were taking a vote since these guys clearly aren't going to give up. Um, and they decided they no longer want any abolitionists in Barnesville. Um, however, um, it, it's pretty sad because Eli Nichols actually left Belmont County for Coshocton area um, in 1839 um, due to the continual harassment for his work. So um, one thing also, people... In the early 1800s, Northerners thought slaves were happy on the plantations. Um, they were completely misled um, by Southern newspapers, or if a Northerner went down South to visit a plantation, the, the plantation owner told the, um, the slaves to act happy. Um, like we're all one big happy family. And they did, they did as they were told. So um, one thing that really swayed uh, Northerners' minds on the issue of slavery was Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, it was a bestseller, for a national bestseller for two years in a row. And that really opened up people's eyes to the issues of slavery. You know, then they started asking questions like, is this true? Is this, is this really how it is down there? Are they treated this horribly? And then all of a sudden, the mind started changing and the eyes started opening to the horrors of slavery. But it wasn't until um, later on, unfortunately. So, um, William Bundy. Um, William Bundy Sr. and his wife, Sarah, 
working doctors and abolitionists. Um, they hid the slaves in the loft of their barn, um, which was pretty common because um, most people had barns back then. Um, and there were also um, underground um, escape routes from either the house to the barn, barn to the creek, um, to a ravine. Um, so that happened a lot too. But here we have Mr. Bundy. And I got to meet the great, great granddaughter of um, William Bundy, Marie Bundy from Barnesville. And she happened to share these letters with me, um, which was really neat. So William Bundy Jr. was actually part of a literary club and he wrote about his thoughts on abolition. And I actually have a friend sitting right there, Mr. Corey, who uh, recorded himself as um, William Bundy Jr. So I'm gonna play that for you. And this is, is his essay on abolition. Hopefully this works. This <laughs> we'll see if it works. <laughs> I believe that one of the most successful steps that can be made towards the abolition of American slavery could be to refuse to have anything to do with the produce raised or manufactured by the slaves. This would undoubtedly have a strong tendency to make the southern slaveholders set their slaves at liberty. For when they see that the northern states will no longer uphold them in keeping their fellow beings bound down in slavery, that would at once set them at liberty. Because thou know that if thou set a raid from the northern states, it would be impossible for them to hold their slaves any longer. For thou art so numerous that the southern states alone could not keep them in subjection. Then thou would be advised to set them free on good terms or at the point of a bayonet. But I do not wish to go to any rash means to get the Negro free, but to let us reason with their masters on the subject. Talk to them kindly and tell them that we cannot make use of produce, which has been so dearly bowed, but when thou wilt set their slaves at liberty and give them wages for their labor, we will deal them and associate with them as brothers and make use of their produce freely. Now some will say that if we were to refuse to buy the southern states, that produce would raise, but even if it did not cost more, we could make use of it freely. And any man that would buy slave produce because it is cheaper, he is no better than a slave owner. For undoubtedly, if we uphold and encourage slavery by partaking of the profit of it, we are worse if possible than the slave owners themselves, because we endeavor to blind them so that thou may not see the evils of slavery and the calamity which it will bring upon the nation if allowed to exist. So that really paints a picture of what an abolitionist was thinking at that time period. Um, when we look at Mount Pleasant, um, they have a free labor store. So um, one thing the abolitionists were trying to do was make sure that the produce that they bought was not produced by slaves. Um, so um, they had these free labor stores. And um, I believe Mount Pleasant has, um, has redone their free labor store um, to its original state. So, and they also have um, every first weekend in August, I believe they have tours, which is really neat where they open the town for, for a historical tour. So I suggest that. Um, but thank you, Corey, for uh, reading that for me. But um, it really is fantastic to have some, some firsthand account like that. Um, it was very exciting. But so, William Bundy Jr. was more of an agent. Um, he did occasionally take in the runaway slaves, but for the, for the most part, he was, the, he was taking them from one station to the next and then back. Um, 
the reason these homes were five to 10 miles apart from each other was because they had to, the agent had to make it from their location to the next station and back before daybreak. Um, so I, it's a very dangerous job. Captina. Um, Captina was one of the first um, African settlements in Ohio. Um, there's nothing left of Captina except for the cemetery and it was memorialized and um, there is now an Ohio historical marker in place um, in um, 2002. That, that was a wonderful endeavor. Um, but the leader of the Captina community was a part of the Underground Railroad. Um, he was an agent and I, I saw his name more um, across different resources than anyone. So there wasn't too many stories. It was just constant mentioning of his name and, and how big he was with the Underground Railroad. Um, he was sort of the leader and then when he passed, Thomas Pointer became the leader of the, the movement. So it's, it's really exciting. But um, there was a lot of discrimination in Ohio, um, especially during that time period. Uh, despite Ohio being a free state, it was only free by one vote. Um, between the years of 1807 and 1821, um, Ohio had a set of black laws. Um, if a freed slave wanted to settle in Ohio, they had to post a $500 bond, um, provide two letters from two different white men stating that they would be on their best behavior, that they were hardworking, no criminal record, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they did make it very difficult for freed slaves to settle here. Um, so therefore, and even Barnesville, which um, there was definitely a lot of uh, pro-slavery sentiment, but they settled outside of the town, which um, I think this is about, uh, I want to say 10 miles outside of town. And they did establish their own church um, the African Methodist Episcopal Church um, that and Sandy Harper had donated 125 acres um, for that effort. So it's it's quite a unique story and it's sad that there is, is nothing left of that settlement except for the cemetery. Um, and it is on Google Map. So if you ever feel like uh, checking it out, taking a nice drive, um, I highly recommend it. So Dr. William Schooley, he sort of, um, it, it's kind of funny how these men are every, have every possible career path possible. <laughs> so this gentleman did everything. Um, he was a teacher, he was a preacher, he was a doctor, he was an abolitionist, he was a conductor, um, but he had his station in Somerton and he worked with Alexander Harper, um, Alexander Sandy Harper and Captina. They worked together. Um, but from his house, there was an escape route from um, the, an underground tunnel that went from the house to a ravine um, for a quick escape. Um, but there wasn't too many stories on him, just a lot of mentionings of his name. So there was rumor um, that the Black Horse Inn was um, used for the Underground Railroad um, and that there may have been a tunnel underneath, though there wasn't any proof. So um, while I was doing my research, I, I met with uh, John Radizak, who is one of the uh, current owners of the inn, and we had a long discussion. Um, so as I was looking at the, the doing my research, William Sweeney was the tavern owner in 1841. But then I noticed um, a letter written to Wilbur Siebert by a M.E. Sweeney, different last name spelling. 
Um, so when I started doing my research, I realized that um, the name on the plaque was wrong. It was spelled wrong. Um, so then I started putting two and two together and realized that the tavern owner was a conductor and agent. Um, the letter specifically talks about um, one night um, there were 11 runaway slaves that stayed at their house for a week. And then there was another story where um, William Sweeney was transporting runaway slaves. And as he was going through Barnesville, the plantation owner of the slaves was standing on the front steps of this hotel. So, and at that same moment, the baby in the back of the wagon started wailing. And luckily, the, gen the plantation owner did not notice. <laughs> So they continued on their way and pretended like nothing was going on. Um, so I thought that was a really, really interesting story um, about William Sweeney and the Black Horse Inn, which um, also the Black Horse Inn may be the last remaining stagecoach stage coach stops. So it's quite a neat, they have restored the outside, but they are currently working on restoring the inside of the inn. Um, so Dr. Nathan and Sarah Johnson. Um, Nathan Johnson was actually the older brother of um, Bushrod Johnson. And so they spent um, their earlier years in Barnesville and then they relocated to Belmont. At that time it was called Wrightstown. And uh, Nathan Johnson's story is very much alike to Eli Nichols. Um, they left Belmont probably about eight, early 1840s um, for Indiana and for the same reasons. Um, cons they, they were considered a disgrace for their, for their, acti their abolitionist activities um, and they were disliked. Um, they, were, they had thrown, stones thrown at them, they were egged. Um, but uh, Dr. Johnson was also um, a doctor, teacher, um, abolitionist. I think he also practiced law for a little while. So he was certainly uh, dabbled in all the uh, um, interesting career paths. So um, here we have Frederick Douglass. Um, so Frederick Douglass was a very interesting individual. Um, you know, we all know that he was a great orator. Um, but he was more than that. Um, so he was an ex-slave. He taught himself how to read and write, and he was very articulate. Um, so as um, in Nantucket, um, William Lloyd Garrison found Frederick Douglass. So backing up, William Lloyd Garrison um, was considered a radical abolitionist. Um, so he had his own group, the Garrisonian abolitionists. They were, they, they were more active, more vocal, um, and uh, John Brown was a Garrisonian abolitionist. So that kind of paints the picture there. Uh, so, so they meet in Nantucket and William Lloyd Garrison talks Frederick Douglass into joining the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. He agrees. So the group of them decide they're going to do a 100 days of talks. Um, a week prior to embarking um, onto the state of Ohio, originally they were going to take the southern route along the Ohio River, but um, Frederick Douglass was beat um, after a talk outside of Indianapolis. So once he recovered, the group split in half Douglas and half of the group took the um, central route through Ohio um, because it made Douglas feel a little safer um, while the other group took the southern route. But lucky for us, he went through um, Belmont County. And I believe he spoke at the Red Brick Tavern. And um, I have what I believe to be his speech that he would have spoke at this red brick tavern along 40.
My friends, I've come to tell you about slavery. What I know as I have felt it. When I came to the North, I was astonished to find that the abolitionists knew so much about it that they were acquainted with its deadly effects as well as if they had lived in its midst. But though they can give you this history, though they can depict its horrors, they cannot speak as I can from experience. the class leader cross and tie the hands of one of his young female slaves and latch from the fair skin and justify the deed by the quotation from the Bible. He who knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. Our masters do not hesitate to prove from the Bible that slavery is right and ministers of the gospel tell us that we were born to be slaves. Look at our hard hands and see how wisely Providence has adapted them to do labor. And then tell us, holding up their delicate white hands, that theirs are not fit for work. Some of us know very well that we have not time to cease from labor, or ours will get too soft. But I have heard the superstitious ones explain, and ignorant people are always superstitious, that if ever a man told the truth, that would be. A large portion of the slaves know that they have a right to their liberty. It is often talked about and read of, but some of us know how to read. Although all our knowledge is gained in secret. Yes, so it was abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass who um, really started swaying the minds of the public. Um, he was a wonderful speaker. He, he could speak from the experience of being enslaved. Um, at first, um, a lot of people did not believe that he was he had been enslaved because he spoke so well. Um, so um, that was definitely um, a deterrent at times. But he he was an amazing speaker and and he did a lot of talks um, until I think it was I think his last speech was just uh, a few years before his death. Um, but he also spoke in Mar Martin's Ferry. He spoke in Quaker City. Um, so he tr he even he traveled across seas and did talks in in London. He did talks um, in France. So he he had he was well respected and um, accepted. Um, Dangerfield Newby. Um, this is a very interesting story, but. So Dangerfield Newby was the first shot and killed at the um, raid on Harper's Ferry, uh, Virginia, today West Virginia. How did he get there? Who is he? Um, well, he was enslaved in Virginia. His father, Henry Newby, um, impregnated uh, one of his slaves, Elsie, um, and gave birth to Dangerfield. Um, together, Henry Newby and Elsie Newby had 11 children. And so at one point, and I do not know why they moved to Bridgeport, but um, Henry Newby manumitted or freed his slaves um, or his family, and they moved to Bridgeport. 
However, um, Dangerfield actually married another woman on another plantation down in Virginia, and they had children together. So um, now that he was in the North and she was still enslaved in Virginia, he began soliciting um, to raise money to buy his family and bring them to Ohio. Um, so there at Oberlin, um, he met John Brown. And like I said, John Brown was, was a radical abolitionist, a uh, Garrisonian abolitionist. And, um, and so uh, Dangerfield Newby thought that if he assisted John Brown, he would be compensated uh, financially. And so he joined the cause and he was the first shot. Um, so after that, Newby's family um, tried to um, continue raising money, but they could not find his family. Um, Dangerfield's wife and children were sold down and um, shipped down to Louisiana. So they were not able to um, free his family. But that is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? So how did the slaves know where to go? They must have met somebody. You said they were agents that led them from one house to the other, but how did they even start the journey? Um, so the slaves left the plantation under the cover of darkness. Um, there were different ways um, that they could have found out where to go and how to get there, um, such as songs or, um, you know, word of mouth or um, because it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write in the South. So they had to find other ways and song was highly used. Was there some sort of signal? Um, houses, laundry, hung up some houses. Yes. Um, so there were many different indicators of safe houses. Um, it could have been a lantern in the attic window, kitchen window, a blanket over the porch banister, um, the lawn jockey. Um, they weren't universal. Um, they were kind of set in stone by the um, anti-slavery societies. Um, you kind of laid the groundwork of how things were going to go. Um, great question. Anyone else? Do you have any information on um, some of the houses in West Virginia? Um, I do not know much about the stations in West Virginia, um, but I would like to learn more. And maybe Miss Margaret Brennan, who's right here, might be able to answer some of your questions about West Virginia. Yes, it's definitely difficult. Um, there's there's a lot of rumors, and you know, how do you decide if a house is a station or not, or was used for the Underground Railroad? Well, you have to look at the family. Um, you know, uh, were they listed as an abolitionist or conductor? Um, were they part of the anti-slavery society? Um, you know, what religion were they? Um, you know, you really have to dive into that because, and, and a lot, like I said, a lot of people didn't document their activities. Um, and even after the ending of slavery, they were still afraid to talk about it. So I, I think, I think the Underground Railroad was actually much bigger than what we know of it um, because a lot was unspoken. Great question. Others? Uh, in your research, did you run across that book that was out several years ago, had the quilts? Oh, yes. Um, Hidden in Plain View. Uh, yes, let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> so, the quilt codes are currently being debated among historians. Um, some believe they they were used. Um, so for those of you who do not know what the quilt codes are, um, they were patterns um, that were um, quilted together in quilt form. And it's said that they were hung out um, for the runaway slaves to be able to read 
and as they were going along. Um, so the story goes, there were two historians, they went down to either North Carolina or South Carolina. And um, so they, they interviewed a descendant of a slave. And so this woman told them this whole story about the quilt coat. Um, however, today, years later, even though this is still being taught in schools, um, they're saying that the patterns are considered to be post antebellum. Um, and it, I don't know. I can't say if I believe it or not. I love the story because I also know how creative the um, abolitionists were and the conductors were. Um, so I'm not really sure how I feel about it, but I certainly did my research on it. But it's a great book and I do recommend it because it's a good story. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what breaches in security, what, what, concept, what breaches happened during uh, the, the slaves coming north and what consequences did the conductors and the abolitionists receive? I mean, with that, with that, with that large, you have to consider that breaches were Found. Yeah. As well as they try to keep it hidden, but you have to understand that had to be some security at the time. What happened with those people involved and what were the dangers of the breach? Absolutely. Um, so it was illegal to assist runaway yeah. slaves. Right. And if you were caught, you were fined $1,000 or in prison for six months. However, if you had a lot of friends, they would bail you out. <laughs> so, especially if you were part of an anti-slavery society, um, they, they set back money for those instances. And it did happen a lot. <laughs> and you mentioned Cappuccino. Um, a long time ago, in my lifetime, which is not that long ago, we used to go to a, a family reunion in Cappuccino Creek. There was a green mall that was there. And there was a, a, a large general store right across from the, the green mall. And I know that's all covered over now with vegetation. I don't think great quality is there anymore. This is probably the early to mid 1980s. And I just didn't know if that was part of the, the railroad connection to there. I do not know. Yeah. It's, it's kind of between Captain Creek and uh, there's another area outside of there. Um, I can't remember the name of the, the, the small town. But I can remember going to Great and how old that, that building felt, even when I was very young. Seven years old, and I always wanted to have some I I know that William Schooley's house was yeah. located right beside the cemetery. Okay. Um, but I do not know of any remaining structures yeah. for the community of Captina. Okay. Yes, yeah. but that's a great question. Yeah. Yes. Where exactly in Wayland, Virginia, was the slave auction block located? <laughs> Market Plaza. Where Stone's Plaza is, right? Yes. Right. 10th and Market Street. Yeah. Yes, Margaret. Well, um, I would say if they were caught, they would be returned down south. Um, but I didn't come across anything stating specifically or any specific stories um, about that. Um, but then again, I would say I, they were safer prior to 1850, but afterwards, no. So. What did the owners do generally Yeah, definitely um, a lot of punishment for for the enslaved who ran. Um, such as um, the floggings or whips. Um, it could have been any sort of torture. 
but definitely um, the lashings were most prominent type of torture for punishment. Yes. Will you elaborate on the Quakers or the Friends Church today? Yes. Um, one thing I have noticed is that um, the Quakers are definitely diminishing. Um, I think um, at its height in the, the 1800s, there were about nine uh, meeting houses in, Bar in Belmont County. Um, and now I think there's only two or three that are currently active. So it's, it's becoming smaller and smaller, definitely. And the Friends Church, uh, the University in Kansas, is that affiliated with the Quakers? I do not know. You're welcome to come to the Friends Church in Mount Pleasant, that's right. Oh, okay. Please do. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Mount Pleasant is fantastic. And it's a beautiful drive, too. But use your GPS, you'll get lost. <laughs> yeah. I still can't go there without using my uh, Google Maps. Could you give a time frame about how long the Underground Railroad was active? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it definitely started picking up steam in the early 1800s. Um, you know, people always ask me, you know, when did it start? I do not know when it started. There's no pinpoint in time, um, but it definitely, I feel like, you know, ever since slavery has been active, you know, in this country, there was already people assisting. Um, helping. Um, there, there certainly, but it became more organized in the early 1800s. It became um, very popular in the 1850s and then ended with the Civil War. Yeah, I think it's just amazing given the secrecy of it that had to be a part of that, that the network uh, in the, between the stations you know, 10 or 15, yeah. how that evolved. I mean, I think that's got to be an interesting story uh, because it belies the secrecy trying to set up a network of that complexity. Exactly. Um, it, it had to have been very difficult to keep it secret. You know, who can you trust to keep the secret? Who's, who's going to tell? Um, so it, it was definitely very dangerous work. Yeah, I guess I think that he may have to be during the Fugitive Slave Act period when it was most uh, detrimental that one was caught uh, in how the secrecy had to have been really that much greater during that period of time, I would think. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. Um, you know, if prior to 1850, you know, you could probably tell your neighbor, hey, I'm helping this guy out. You want to help this guy? And then all of a sudden, it had to we, really go underground. Yes. yes. Yeah. Now you have to start watching your back. You have to start watching who you're talking to um, because the plantation owners and the bounty hunters would work with the local sheriffs. Um, you well, know, very emboldened by that. Mm -hmm. Play yes. They would be more aggressive in their tracking down the slaves. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's important to note, too, um, for the plantation owners, the more slaves you had, the higher your societal status was. Um, it was a sign of wealth um, and obviously free labor. So the more slaves you lost, the angrier the plantation owner got, the higher the reward money above the runaway slave's head, and et cetera. In yes? Your, in your research, you and this kind of as an addendum to what the gentlemen that are there, um, the Pickerington Association of trying to work with the slave owners in a, as a private security agency to bring back some of these slaves. They're considered property, so it's, it's like stealing a car. As of today, it has some material wealth to it. Did, did your research show anything that a, a major national security agency at that time that would be hired in by the, the Southern State Plantation Homeless Security people back? 
The most I've seen is bounty hunters. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't heard well, of any agency yet. Right. But I, I right. you're thinking of parallel, parallel to that idea, right? You'd have to always keep that as a, as a you'd almost have to hire an unknown or someone who's willing to be a private mm -hmm. uh, individual to bring it back. You oh, yeah. National agency to it. Yeah. You discover these people are trying to bring it back up all. And I think there's many instances of when the slaves were recaptured, they were sent further into the South. Yes. You mentioned yeah. like Louisiana, for example. You get them, you know, really, so they can't do that. They can't do that. Yes, that's a very good point. Any other questions? Yes. I have a general question. Are there any books or anything written on how enslaved people were treated by other people? What was their skin color? Because I know, like, not everyone, like, my great 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 grandmother was a free black woman. So I'm wondering, and this was during the time of slavery, why was she not a slave? Or, you know, like, what determined whether a person was a slave or not? Well, there's examples of slave of slaves owning slaves, right? So period of time. Just exactly. Yeah, you would you would probably have to do a, a lot of digging. Um, you know, just um, just uh, because someone was black in that time period definitely did not mean they were enslaved. Um, there were a lot of um, free um, African Americans also, you know, in in free states. Um, so it, it varies. That she maybe she bought her freedom um, because sometimes that was an option, or um, if the if their owners died, um, sometimes once. Um, Let's, let's say um, the plantation owner passes away. He passes his slaves on to the wife, but then the wife passes away. And in her will, she then decides to manumit her slaves. So that's a possibility too. But that did happen a lot. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah.